This is a University of Otago podcast. So welcome everybody. It's really nice to see you. As Wing said, we'll hopefully get lots more people. Uh, certainly tomorrow I think we'll have a few more people along um, as it's a full day. Um, as you can see, we're about to, I'm about to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, it is a, it is, um, a great pleasure to have Som, Dr. Som Naidu here. He's come across from Australia, came across yesterday afternoon, and um, was greeted by overcast skies, sunny skies this morning, and suddenly downpours. So he's um, experienced quite a, a bit of changeable weather already in the few hours that he's been here. I'll just get my little, my notes out here. <laughs> Okay, it's my honour to welcome Dr. Som Naidut as our keynote speaker for the symposium. Som has spent most of his professional life in the higher education sector in a variety of roles to do with enhancing learning and teaching practices in distance education, online learning and e-learning. And he's also, of course, done much work in education more generally in various jurisdictions jurisdictions and geographical locations. He's currently at Monash University in Melbourne, but has also worked at Swinburne University of Technology, also in Melbourne, Charles Sturt University in New South Wales, the University of Melbourne, and uh, the University of Southern Queensland. And he spent some time studying and working in Canada at Concordia University in Montreal. He's held a range of positions, from teaching positions through to advising and combinations of both. But the ever present, but ever present is his capacity and interest in researching open and distance and flexible learning and teaching. Many, many publications, many publications. Soma's publications include several books, book chapters, and more than a hundred peer reviewed journal articles and conference papers. He is frequently invited to be a keynote speaker at national and international conferences. And uh, Dr. Naidu possesses an extensive record of research and scholarship in that broad field of open distance and flexible learning, which he is asked to speak about time and time again. In addition to those uh, roles, he's held many consultancy positions in, uh, for projects around the world. Currently, Dr. Naidu is the, is the president of the Open, Distance, Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. He's the executive editor of its journal called Distance Education. He's assistant editor of the journal Interactive Learning Environments. He's a co-editor of the Rutledge book series, series on open, flexible and distance learning. And he's a member of the inaugural Rutledge Education Arena panel of editors. I will leave it to Som to fill in any gaps or to correct any mistakes I've made and uh, let him get on with his talk. We're privileged indeed to have you here, Som. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Som Naidu and his presentation entitled Mainstreaming Open, Flexible and Distance Learning. I hope this mic's working. It looks like it's working. It sounds like it's working. Um, so I'm going to move around for a little bit. Thank you, Sarah, for, for that lengthy introduction. Not so sure how much of that is well deserved, but um, thank you all for coming and thank you for the invitation, Sarah. Um, it is customary in Australia to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land before speaking at occasions like this, so let me do the same. Uh, um, it is, it is uh, as I said, uh, a privilege to be here. I, when, when Sarah asked me about a year ago, uh, it was uh, like November last year, and I said, oh my God, I don't know what my life's going to be like in one year's time. But I did commit to it, and I'm glad that uh, I'm not sick or uh, unable to come, that I've been able to come for, for various reasons. And, and thank you all for coming. Um, to, to listen to me and, and to listen to yourselves. Uh, I'll talk more about that a bit later, but a bit of nostalgia because uh, you've got uh, your own anniversary here. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, 
Oh my God, it's like about 40 years ago when I came to New Zealand. 1976 it was. I might not look that old, but I am quite old. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I came to do, uh, as, as many of you will know, some of you will know, Claire in particular, I was born in Fiji Islands. I worked at the University of the South Pacific after I graduated from University of Waikato. So yes, I've been here. I know New Zealand quite well, and uh, I've got family living here as well. Um, and I was thinking, oh my God, it's 40 years, and you're 30 years, there's, there's a lot to think about. And when, when Sarah proposed that I travel throughout New Zealand, I thought, what a way to, you know, top off, you know, a, a career in, 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 in education, fundamentally, but then in distance education. I was very lucky. Uh, um, that soon after I graduated with an education degree from University of Waikato, um, I chose not to stay in New Zealand, went back to Fiji, and got a job at the University of the South Pacific, where Claire uh, worked uh, much later, after, after I had left. And um, that's where I got introduced to distance education. I was one of their first course developers. and. Um, we used to use a uh, telecommunication system through the uh, ATS-1 satellite at that time, so I was familiar with that. And then I was, again, very fortunate to, uh, to do a PhD in educational technology, because I was interested in technology in Montreal, Canada, which really then opened up a whole other sleuth of opportunities that, that brought me to Australia, which is where I've been. And then in Australia, I worked in, in both conventional educational systems like University of Melbourne and, and now at Monash, and, and distance education operations like USQ, Charles Sturge University that Sarah mentioned. So th that's a fascinating mixture of things because you, you might wonder, well, how, how do you shuffle back and forth between a, a distance education operation like USQ and, um, and, and, and University of Melbourne, which is, I suppose, very much like University of Otago. But that's a story in its own, and, um, and I thought I would reflect all, all, on all of that in, in the next half hour, and, um, and, and Sarah asked me to do that, and, so, uh, and then she also said, oh, you've got to write this thing. I said, yeah, right, you know, I've got to write this thing. But as I said to her last night, that I'm glad she forced me to do that, because it, 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 it set me down and said, okay, let's think about where we and you have come from, where have we been and where are we going? And I thought, oh, so when I started putting all of that together, I was quite pleased with it. And with the help of Wing here, we've been able to publish that in the book. So as you said, if you haven't read it, read it tonight, because we still have an opportunity tomorrow to have a bit of chat about that. But what I've done is, um, is uh, captured the essence of it um, in these PowerPoint slides. So I'll just, just flip through these and, and, uh, and, and talk us through. Uh, as I was saying to Sarah, you know, what, what I would do is I, I'd go through these things and, um, and then we, if, we, if we could, even though we're a small group, we could ch save the questions till later, uh, otherwise we could get bogged down. What I've tried to do here is, as I said to Sarah, th there's not much I can tell you. What could I tell people like Claire? They know it all, right? You know, and most of you around the place. So, so I, I thought that what I would do is I would ask hard questions and raise issues, controversial ones, and say, all right, let's think about this whole thing. Remember, I've got a very mixed background, both from conventional and distance education operations. So I'm trying to put the whole of that together and, um, and reflect on, on where the field is going more than where it has been. But we'll start where it has been. I found this little slide quite attractive. If you haven't seen it, 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 it um, it captures some of the essence of where distance education was. I mean, as you see, um, this guy is saying, uh, fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. So who do you think is going to be able to climb that tree? And I think distance education has been in that kind of situation for a very long time, if we go back to the 60s or the 70s, that it's all, always been judged and compared with conventional face-to-face campus-based educational experience. And, and uh, uh, Fred Jevons, you know, the vice chancellor of Deakin University in Australia, Victoria, Australia, put it very aptly when he used the term parity of esteem. 
Not comparability, that's different from, from parity of esteem. So distance education in those days was looking for this parity of esteem, the same kind of esteem that conventional campus-based education was being held with. But that was then. That might have been the case in the 60s and 70s, uh, even in the 80s. But I think we are in a different world right now. And not think, I think we are. Well, we are in a different world right now. The, the, the presence of ICT is really is changing the ball game. Information and communication technology, which makes distance education a lot more accessible and available and attractive to a whole range of people. But one of the things that I, 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 I get irritated about is that a lot of the people at, uh, in organizations at the moment are ignoring very significant advances in learning and teaching at a distance that have already been made. So what I'm going to do is, is basically this. I'm going to raise the critical issues very quickly, but I'm going to spend more time on challenges and opportunities. And one of the things that a lot of universities are talking about is policy development. So, okay, so if we know that these kinds of things that we are familiar with, distance educators are familiar with, is infiltrating, if I can use that word, and uh, I've thought about that word, is infiltrating the campus-based educational experience, then, then, then what are the implications for that for policy development in terms of learning and teaching more generally? See, I, 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 th I think that's, that's the nub of the issue here. And, then, and, and, and what I'm trying to do here in the paper that, that Wing has published is to take a, a synoptic view of, 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 of the field, so to speak, using these, 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 uh, these lenses, as I call it. Uh, and some of these are, these are things that you would have seen before. In fact, you know, if you, if, if you are familiar with the distance education literature, in 1980, 1980 uh, the journal that I currently edit, uh, which is distance education, uh, that belongs to, which belongs to the Open Distance Learning Association Australia, carried an article by Desmond Keegan. Some of you will remember him if you're familiar with that literature. He foreshadowed some of these things, so I've kind of capitalized on that and used that as a framework to reflect on 40 years or 30 to 40 years of, 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 of our life in this field. So this life of living on the fringes and the influence of the organization, mediation, connection and communication, and more so now we talk about distributed and disaggregated learning irks me again, because these are fancy words for things that we've been familiar with for a very long time. But more of that later. I also found this uh, uh, attractive, and, and I'll leave it there, Plato saying, those who are able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture, if, if, you, if you replace the word culture with education, or learning and teaching, will never be understood, let alone believed by the masses. And I was thinking, Distance educators have been on the forefront of learning and teaching for a very long time. So how is it that distance educators have been on the periphery and on the sidelines for such a long time? Maybe that says something about it. Okay, just back a little. Uh, uh, yeah, there we are. So, so what are the issues? And, and, and I like to begin with this quote by Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen, again, if, you, if you're not familiar uh, with Amartya Sen, um, Sen, it was, I think, 1979, I'm not sure, Nobel Prize winner for economics. And um, his big thing is about development. And, um, and um, he, he, he regarded education and so education as a basic need and he was talking about freedom and justice. And he was saying, and he's saying, that education is really the path to real freedom. Without education, you, you don't have much freedom. I mean, and I, I reflect on my life. I, 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 I'm a product of uh, a, a very poor circumstances. I was born on a sugarcane farm in Fiji Island. Sometimes I look at my life and I say, how did I get out of there? And, 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 here, in, in, at least here, for example, and, and that's, a, that's another story. But I think what Amartya Sen is saying that, you know, uh, 
money alone is not going to do the job. That education is the path that will get you that freedom, that mobility, that, that, that you would need to have a, a, a fruitful and, and full life. Um, but if that were true, I mean, again, I'm going to come back to this one. If education is the path to real freedom, then how are we going to make education available to the masses, these kinds of people? As such, it was appropriate that, that distance education was a minimalist provision. And this is a term that I will come back to, that edu distance education needed to be lean and mean. Because if it were not lean and mean, that it would not be accessible to the vast majority. There was very good reason to do that. The print materials, independent learning, that's it. That way you could reach the largest number of people. More complexity means more exclusivity. However, because of that, the traditional campus-based uh, groups regarded that as learning at the back door. And Chuck Wiedemeyer from University of Wisconsin uh, used that a long time ago. And as a result of that, it was always you know, struggling to, to attract comparable kudos. So what were the sticking points? The sticking points really, really are these. This is structure and guidance. And, and those of you who are educationists or psychologists, you know, um, would, would, would probably be familiar with an article that I think John Sweller from University of New South Wales and, um, and Paul Kirshner from the Open University of Netherlands wrote in the Educational Psychologist. Wing is laughing, I'm sure he's read that. Which talks about structure and guidance how much structure and guidance, and what is structure and guidance? Uh, how is that kind of structure and guidance provided in learning and teaching generally? Uh, and is, teach, is the teacher, is the stand-up teacher in front of the lecture room the source of that? Can structure and guidance be provided in different ways and in, in different, using different technologies? And it raises the question of what do you think learning and teaching is about? This is not the first time I'm sure you've thought about these sorts of things, but I'm raising this in context, and I found that this, this image here explains a little bit. Oftentimes when somebody asks us to teach something, you know, and I find this happening all around the world, people say, all right, what are the topics that I'm going to begin with? What do I teach? Whereas when you are looking at that side of the equation and say, well, what do you want the learner to be able to do? Then they tell you, am I going to teach topics or am I going to teach the student? Am I going to teach the learner? And that, that's, that's, that's an interesting conversation to have on its own, and, you know, uh, which is the essence of educational literacy. I'm covering a lot of ground, I know. We could talk about any one of these slides for the next two hours, but, but l let me just push on and, 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 and see where we go. Um, so, as I said, issues, challenges, and opportunities. Now, what I want to focus on is what, what, what are the opportunities in all of this? Where are the opportunities? So would you consider, I mean, we are practitioners in the field, would you consider DE any less robust? Are they, are they the second cousin? Are they the fringe dwellers? And then if they are the fringe dwellers, and the fringes of what? What are we talking about when we're talking about fringes, right? And if we are talking about fringes, then what is at the center? What may have been at the center in 1980, or 1990 even, is probably not at the center anymore. So what is at the center now? What is our core business now as educators? Or what, would, you, would you consider campus-based experience as the gold standard? Now remember, I come from University of Melbourne. All right? Ivy League by Australian standards, you know, uh, campus-based. Uh, um, if so, I'm not negating the fact that the gold standard might work in some situations, but not all situations. And that, but, but how helpful is it to compare and contrast modes? You know, I might say, why are we comparing distance education with face-to-face -face education? And when I use the term distance education, um, I'm using open, flexible in distance education, right? I'm not just, just, not just meaning distance education. I'm talking about a whole range of things. I mean, would you say, why should, why should the two be compared? They, they serve different groups of people. Isn't there an argument to be made there? And, 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 and what are the implications of that discussion on policy development? 
The sec- so that was, th- th- that was thinking about it from this, this point of living on the fringes. The, the second lens that I'm, I was thinking about this, this, this idea of the organization, and I thought this, these two images capture it. I'll talk more about this. This is an example of a very conventional university uh, with buildings and, and a quadrangle, much like University of Otago has. And then this is a new concept. Some of you who are not familiar with this is this idea of the OER university. There's a thing called the OER university, which doesn't have bricks and mortar. And, and, uh, and it, it basically depends on a model of learning and teaching that draws uh, on courses from anywhere, from any organization, any institution, or may not even be an institution, learning support provided to students by anybody from anywhere in the world, open assessment, open content, open educational resource and accreditation that can be submitted to any university provided they buy into it for credit. Now, you don't need an organization for this as opposed to this. So, the, so when, when we were talking about, when Desmond Keegan said that that a hallmark feature of distance education is the influence of an organization. Well, that's blown out of the water around Desmond, you know, because the, the models are changing. And, and how much more it's going to change in the future is anyone's guess, and that's what we're going to talk about. The issues here, as some of you and many of you, I presume, would know, that, you know, pioneering initiatives were represented by terms like this. We had extramural studies, external studies, extension studies, and, and, and correspondence education, and distance education. But there was, after 20, 30 years of existence, you know, other terms came into, into play because of the nature of the transaction was changing. And these were things like flexible learning, blended learning, distributed learning, desegregated learning. They're not the same sorts of things, you might argue. Yeah, they are not. They are not, not, they're not the same sorts of things. These things were different things. These things are different things. And I think we will have uh, to think about that. So, so w- w- the challenges here in relation to this lens about the organization has got to do with this. The influence and sponsorship of an organization. And, 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 and the form and function, and the form and function uh, of this defining attribute is undergoing change. This is, this is I, 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 I'm sure Desmond will have a view about that as well. Um, partly and largely because uh, the variety of educational institutions are starting to adopt and engage with distance education. Almost everybody is now engaging with different uh, with distance education practices in, in different ways. Um, so as a result of all of that, the nature of the organization is changing. That organization that Desmond Keegan was talking about um, as, have, as, as a hallmark feature of distance education as different from independent study. I mean, anybody can study any time, but when we were talking about distance education, we were talking about the, 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 the role of the, of the organization in it. Um, so where are the opportunities where are the opportunities in that from an organizational perspective? The organizations of the future, what, what, what do you think the educational organization of the future would look like? Um, and one might argue, uh, can educational provision be seen as a right or responsibility of any particular type of organization? Who is to govern that? How critical is the role of the organization? Now, here, here's a question. I know there are people in Otago uh, who are leading the charge in regards to uh, OER University. I'm surprised somewhat that Wayne McIntosh is not here, although uh, he knows that I'm around here. Uh, he is the proponent of o- OER University. The, the concept of the OER University is based on open educational resources, use of open educational resources. Now. You might argue that what's the difference between open educational resources and copyrighted material in in the conventional sense of the term. So how how would an organization based on open educational resources function and the viability of such such an organization? 
what are the implications for this for, for governments and educational institutions, I think. You know, those are very serious conversations that we need to have. And I'm not taking sides on this because many times I, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that we've been prone wrong uh, in, in, um, in our assumptions about where we might go. I mean, and we, some of us are old enough to think where we were only 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and look where we are now. So I'm very careful to, to say that things like MOOCs are not going to work, or OER University is not going to work because, you know, uh, we don't know how the technology is going to change in 10 years' time or five years' time. The, the, the third lens that, that, that I'm talking about here is this, this idea of mediation. One of, the, one of the things about distance education was that it was a mediated form of, of, of communication between the teacher and the student. So there was some, something that was uh, mediating learning and teaching. And, um, and in, the, in, the, in the olden days, you know, um, um, it, it, it was the printed material. Students would be at home um, and, and, and looking at the printed materials, uh, the postal service, and people like Claire ha have articulated that uh, in the video that you just saw playing while, while you were having a cup of tea. Um, so that, that was the traditional, as I said, that was a minimalist form of distance education, and rightly so, because you needed to reach the people, the, as we say, reach the unreached, the people who were, couldn't be reached, you know, they would, they would be living out somewhere in the Pacific Islands or, or in, in the rural Indian subcontinent or the African continent that, you know, uh, would be accessible only, you know, occasionally by, by by land or by sea. So, so it, was, it was appropriate that, you know, uh, that learning and teaching depended on as little as possible, that you know, once you had a package of material, that's all you needed to be able to satisfy the learning outcomes for that course, and, and rightly so. So it was appropriate at that time. But, but as we all know, the printed material had challenges. Uh, while a good set of, a well-designed set of printed materials can be very efficient, very effective, and very complete in itself. But as we know, uh, distance educators will know in particular that a lot of these were very poorly designed and not designed well enough, and it failed to provide that structure and guidance that we were talking about earlier on. So something, uh, it, it contributed to two things. Partly, it gave distance education a, a bad name, so people say, ah, that, that's second class education, that's not good enough, irrespective of the fact that it was designed to meet a particular target audience, like I was just saying, it was for good reason minimalist. Um, but people used to call it substandard and, 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 and second rate, uh, without many of the supports that were available in a face-to-face -face educational setting. So, so it is about then that distance education began to suffer this parity of esteem. Uh, for some of you who would be familiar with this, just bear with us. Uh, I'm going to get to more exciting stuff in a minute. Um, I'm concerned about you being bored by my relation of history. Um, distance educators themselves and learners began to hunger for a little bit more and ask for a little bit more. And this is about when the study center sort of came about to provide more face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and, uh, and teachers were getting frustrated just as well. Uh, but one of the problems of that was then distance education began to look more like face-to-face -face education. It depends on how much interaction and face-to-face -face contact you provide. Uh, so where are you on, on this spectrum of, say, no contact, no communication, to some contact and some communication. So that, that's, 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 that's an issue that uh, began to emerge. Uh, but with more advanced technologies, and the danger, let me just in, in, in that was that, you know, uh, the more face-to-face -face contact you provided or integrated into distance education, the, the more exclusive you be, you, you would become. And, 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 and the more technologies you, you would use, alienated an already disenfranchised group of learners. That's meant to empower. So one could argue that if you included more interaction or interactivity or face-to-face -to -face contact to the traditional model of distance education, 
then you would alienate, disenfranchise, and actually begin not to serve the people that you were designed to serve. That's a, that, that's, a, that's a difficult challenge, isn't it? So where does the balance lie? So what happened? So large numbers of distance learners, especially those in developing contexts, you know, needed distance education opportunities the most, now being denied access because they did not have the technology. So now when a lot of people in conventional education systems talk about online learning, e-learning, cloud-based learning, uh, uh, which, which are fundamentally driven by the principles of distance education, are actually alienating a lot of learners or excluding a lot of learners. And this is the key point that I want to del dwell on a little bit. This begs the question, is it possible that distance education was and is misguided in its assumptions about the degree of structure and guidance? So how much structure and guidance is necessary is the conversation that I think uh, I want to have. But if that were not the case, if distance education wasn't misguided, if distance educators and distance education was right, they, you know, a package of materials could satisfy the study of any subject or in, any unit, and not much more than that was necessary, then you must accept the fact, then we have to accept the fact, that one size does not fit all. And this is the number of my, my point here that there ought to be room and place for different models of distance education operation. That the distance education model that will work in the Pacific, that will work in India, that will work in Africa, may not be good for the distance education model that will, will, be, will, be, will be good and relevant for places like Australia or the UK or, 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 or the US or China, for that matter, where, where people are, are, are connected extensively. Different models of distance education provision are required, and this is, this is my thesis, that I think we should be looking at different models of distance education operation. And if we are doing that, then, then it, 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 it changes the, the ball game quite a bit. Um, so where, where are the opportunities in that? Where are the opportunities that? There must be some fundamental th threshold principles that, 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 that would distinguish one model of operation from another model of operation. And I think we need to have a conversation about what are those threshold principles. And how can we ensure that these are not compromised in our eagerness to meet the demand in whichever way we can. So what are the implications of this, of upholding the principles of institutional policy development around the design and development of distance learners experiences? Uh, and this has an implication on continuing professional development. So, so if that is our thesis, then how are we going, and this is another conundrum, how do we train academics and teachers in organizations to meet those expectations? And then that, that raises the question about the professional development of teaching staff and academic staff. The, the fourth lens that, um, that um, I want, I want to use to reflect on another component of distance education is the thing about uh, connection and, and communication. And, 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 and the images there foreshadow some of my thoughts, you know, uh, connect, uh, communicate, collaborate, and create. Now, issues. What are the issues in relation to that? As I would argue, that the, 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 the ability to connect and communicate is, is one of those threshold principles that I think uh, we have to be wary of and we have to ensure that is there. Uh, it's especially crucial in distance education for all sorts of reasons that we are familiar with uh, uh, in, relation to, in relation to delay and procrastinations and attrition. And, and some of these things we are seeing coming back at us in relation to uh, in relation to the proliferation of online education and MOOCs. There's nothing new about that, and I'll have a, I'll have a bit of a chat about that. You know that you know, the connection and communication thing in the, in the olden days was, was, was provided for by, by the written letter, by the written uh, memorandum, if you like. But, but this kind of conversation, this kind of medium could not be sustained because, you know, who, who is going to sit down and, and, and write those letters? And we see the same thing coming back at us now when we are in the business of e-learning and online learning. 
that, you know, if 2,000 students start emailing you for a response, you know, are you going to respond? Can you respond to 2,000 students or even 200 students? It's not very different from... And when one of, one of, one of our theorists in distance education, Borio Homburg, some of you will remember, talked about this, this guided didactic conversation, this conversation between the learner and the teacher the, in, in the context of distance education was appropriate when you had five or ten students to deal with. You could sit down and write letters at lead and have that conversation. But the MOOC says now, put 2,000 students in the group, and how are you going to sustain that kind of conversation? Even if it were the case of emails. Uh, although you might argue that you know, things have become easier with electronic mail and instant messaging and various social media tools, um, and, and people have started to talk about, oh, you know, uh, things like connectivism and, 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 connect, and, and connective knowledge building and MOOCs, and, and, and connectivism as a theory of learning. Now, I have my concerns about that, but there are people who would argue that, you know, there is something to me to say about connectivism and the theory of learning, that, that you know, knowledge building occurs as a result of people being connected to one another. Now, how does that sit with the original idea of distance education of independent learning? Um, but, but the challenge in, in relation to this is that you know, connectivism and connective knowledge building will not work unless there is connectivity unless people are connected. If people are not connected, so then what? How are you going to do that? You'll have to get into face-to-face -face groups. Uh, so for connectivism and connective knowledge building to work, you require network communication technologies. Sure, in our, in our part of the world, we, we have them. But in various other parts of the world, you don't have them. So these are the challenges. This is why I would argue that we would need different models of distance education, that one size does not fit all. So where are the opportunities in that, in, in relation to that lens? How can connection and communication, which is so crucial for the development of, especially sociologists who believe that, you know, knowledge building is a social process that happens only when you're discussing and debating, uh, be supported in models of distance education the, where it's not possible to have that kind of uh, network or uh, network technologies doesn't exist. Or is it arguable, this is the second way, that connection and communication are counterintuitive principles and counterproductive in distance education? Now, that is a controversial point, right? Is it? Is it not? I'm not taking sides. If so, then, then, then would you argue that distance education is an impoverished form of education? which is what its problem was earlier on. And its value diminished somewhat in educational settings. Where well, it might be arguable that there should be little or no need at all to connect and communicate with student peers and teachers. That you should be able to, you can study without connectivity and communication. Another, another, especially in this area of online education and online learning, connection and communication has cost implication. The more connectivity, there are costs for it. The, as an editor of, of, of a reputable journal, I see a lot of articles now coming up which are, 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 uh, are looking at the cost implications of greater connectivity. Greater connectivity means greater communication. Greater communications means increased workload, which, uh, which academics are always complaining about, right? Uh, rightly so. So, connection and communication, while great ideas, and, and sociologists would love that because they would argue that, you know, it's, it's by connection and communication that we develop knowledge. George Siemens and Stephen Downs have, 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 have proffered a theory of learning and teaching based on connectivism, saying that put a bunch of students together, they will discuss, they will rave on, they will chat on, and knowledge will just emerge as a result of connection and communication. But a lot of people are saying that that has cost implications in terms of, of its management, in terms of its uh, support. 
not only that it means paying for and reliable and regular access, for example, some of the work that is coming out of places like University of South Africa, uh, where uh, open universities are saying that we want to put all our courses online. Well, who is going to pay for reliable connectivity? And in the case of South Africa, uh, it is still very rare for students to have reliable connectivity to be able to be online for extended periods of time to do the kind of work that is required. And for educational institutions, it means access to technological in infrastructure. I mean, in the, in the days when we were talking about audio teleconferencing, uh, sure there were challenges, but the challenges are even greater now uh, when we are talking about information and communications technologies. Cost considerations for staff and students. What are the implications of it for policy development in terms of staffing? I mean, some of the material that I'm seeing these days, for example, has to do with employment of, of staff, marking staff, uh, support staff, in distance education settings, for example, if you have tutors in a course and you assign a number of tutors to uh, spend or look after, say, a, a number of students and, and pay them on the number of hours that they, they, um, they, they use uh, to look after those students, uh, then what do you think they're going to be doing? Marking or supporting students uh, in discussion forum? And you would find that, you know, um, many of them just end up being markers, not really tutors, you know. And so there's a challenge. How do you pay them? And, and if, if you expect them to engage in conversations and monitor those discussions in online forums, then they spend more time on it. And organizations are like, oh, we're not going to pay you for that. Well, we're not going to pay you for them. Tutors are not going to engage in that. One or two might, but the majority will not. This raises the question about this idea of distributed learning. And I've got two more to go, and then we can have a bit more discussion about that. Now, distributed learning is this idea of, uh, of an uncontrolled or a less managed, let's say, less managed educational environment whereby your resources, much like any one of these diagrams, if you like, which I picked up from the net, that you could have a system whereby you know, many things could be used in terms of resources. They could be located anywhere in the world. Your OER could be anywhere or any computer. That is connected. Connectivity is the heart of all of this. And, and, and your, your subject community could be somewhere else. Your management system could be somewhere else. Your library could be somewhere else. You could be somewhere else. And much the same here. Whereby no one organization has central control that's a completely open and networked environment. Hence the term distributed as opposed to distance. Not a one-to-one, -one, but a multi-point arrangement, if you like. So, so wh wh what are the issues in relation to that? Distribute is, is fundamentally, as I said, based on this concept of ubiquitous connectivity. That distributed learning is possible mostly, uh, could be possible otherwise as well, but mostly because you are connected in a learning and teaching environment. Any place, any time, any place. But there's a difference between distance learning and distributed learning. Distance learning, there's a level of control by one or more organizations. In distributed control is not centralized by any organization. The student, actually, you might argue, is in charge. And they can draw resources from anywhere. They can draw support from anywhere. They can, they can uh, go anywhere. And, and however, at the end of the day, meet the requirements of, 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 of the subject and course and get your badge and submit it to whoever will give you credit for it. Instructional control is dispersed. The, such this, well, one could argue there's no such thing as instructional control. Learners, teachers, and the learning resources can be located anywhere. However, this is based on this concept of network communications technologies without which it will not work. So the challenges, the challenges then are, it is dependent on you know, robust and reliable network technologies. Without it, you don't have a distributed learning environment, one could argue. And it is different from the conventional notions of distance education. However, many of the fundamental principles are similar though. And that's a conversation that we need to have. Is it arguable then, in being inclusive, 
is it arguable this distance education is a minimalist or, uh, educational provision? Because remember that the mission of DE is to reach the unreachable. It was designed to serve the needs of the, the non-traditional learner. However, because of its attractiveness in many different ways, distance education methods are now being adopted by conventional education system. However, the more complexity one adds to it, the more inclusive and costly and elitist it becomes. So have we, uh, this, this point is worth thinking about. So have we then compromised? This is the question. Have we then, in our, in our, in our urge, in our, in our search for the use or uh, eagerness to use distance education methods, have we compromised the fundamental threshold principles of distance education and the purpose of distance education? Now that's, that's the point that distance educators need to dwell on. So, so having said all of that, where, where, where are the options? Is that, is that a risk? Holding on to your threshold principles or not to hold on your threshold principles and think in terms of distributed learning, for example, and connection and connectivity, which people rave on and on about. Even traditional distance education organizations such as UNISA uh, in South Africa. Is this a risk distance education can afford to take? If it took it, then what are the implications of distance education as, as, an, as an educational practice? But even if it were to take that, then you might argue, yeah, but in some circumstances, yeah, it would work. We can compromise on that. And, and, we, 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 and which would be those situations? Uh, one could argue then. If not, then what is, what is and ought to be the mission of distance education that we should be holding on to? And as it's been suggested by some people, do you think that distance education as we had known has gone wrong and against its own grain? And if so, then where and how? And as I was saying earlier on, it is arguable that more than one model of distance education is required, that, that the model of distance education that we were familiar with in the 80s and 90s may be suitable for some places, but is not suitable for other places, and there should be different kinds of models of distance education should exist. Why can't we have different models of distance education? And then what would be the policy imperatives for that in terms of the leadership uh, and, and, uh, of organizations? Uh, I mean, uh, an interesting thing was put by this, by, by Sir John Daniel, who is a well-known distance educator, uh, uh, former Vice Chancellor of the United Kingdom Open University, we talked about this iron triangle, as he calls it. Google it if you haven't seen it before. As an engineer, he looks at this, this mathematical model which says, you know, access, quality, cost. He says that if you increase access, which is what online education and MOOCs, for example, are doing at the moment, you risk compromising quality. And if you increase quality, you increase cost. So the, for policymakers, these are the issues that are at the heart of the matter. And, 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 and this, this, this is one of the problems with MOOCs, putting very large numbers of students in, in a course, increasing access, leads to poor quality of education opportunity. Now, would you argue, I don't care. Access is access. The more people that have access to education, the better it is, even if it is of poor quality, one could argue. And I've, I've, I've mentioned this in my written piece. Someone said some, some time ago that um, if something is worth doing, then it's worth doing poorly. If people really need it, they may as well do with something poorer than the best quality. Have something, then nothing. Um, here, is, here, here is where, I mean, I, I'm assuming that a lot of us are, are familiar with this MOOC conversation, but, but what's happening with the MOOC lately? How, how sustainable are the MOOCs? I mean, some of this data that has been put together uh, from the Babson reports, you know, that, that you will find on the web, you know, uh, well, uh, the interesting thing is this, 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 this red line here saying, you know, how sustainable. This is how many people disagree. This is where it was in 2012. Now, look at where it's going in 2014, that more and more 
presidents, I think this was a survey of vice presidents of universities, mostly in, the, in, in North America, many more of them are now beginning to feel that they are not sustainable. Which probably won't surprise you. And, and how many more are, 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 are planning, planning MOOCs? And you see the same thing. 2012, 2000, many more are saying they're not planning MOOCs. Senior executive, chief, chief uh, executives of, of, of uh, educational organizations in the US. Finally, I'm going to stop talking in a little while. This idea of disaggregated learning. And somebody mentioned to me about two years ago saying that the, that the big thing now, and someone very well known, I will not mention names, the big thing now in the world is disaggregated learning. I said, what? And when I started to look up desegregated learning, this is what they meant. The traditional professor, as all of you will be familiar with, designs the course, teaches the course, assesses students, conducts research. The desegregated process is a, is a course team thing. Why is this guy frowning and this guy laughing? Courses delivered by part-time... This is distance education. This is where distance education was. This is what distance educators have been doing for the last 40 years. And somebody tells me in 2013 that this is the way of the world? And I'm saying, where have you been? Issues. DE is disaggregated by nature. So what's new about disaggregation? I, and, and, and one of uh, uh, persons that some of you will be familiar with, Otto Peters, who was the uh, rector, the founding rector of the Fernand Visitat in Germany, the Open University of uh, Germany, uh, and, and uh, Otto is still alive, likened its form to industrial processes where, you know, there's division of labor. Different groups of people are doing different things. Various functions are disaggregated. And this text here explains that, so I'm not going to bother, bother going through that. What is happening now is that mainstream education is being unbundled in the same way the distance education had unbundled these processes. Separations of the OER university is a classic example. The distributed learning model that I was talking about is a classic example of desegregated learning. Course design and development, delivery support are responsibilities of different people. And, and learners will be able to select content, mentoring, coaching, and pay for these services. Now that would be interesting, isn't it? You want coaching? Well, you pay for it. It's happening. I mean, I've just spent two, two weeks in, in Beijing. I mean, private tuition in China and Korea is just going to the roofs. And you think, what is happening in the school that the minute children leave school, they've got to go into private tuition? It raises the big, big question. Unbundling is the key. And, and there are people, even, even, you know, this is 2016. Unbundling is the key to personalized learning. People are talking about things like personalized learning. What is personalized learning and what does it involve? We need to have a conversation about that. But there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of disaggregate releases, I mean, one could argue, that you remember distance educators, you develop the materials, you send it out, it's gone, and then what do you do? Well, you could say, I'm going to spend my time, you know, writing a book or doing some research, you know, or, or, or getting on with other things while students are studying by themselves. So um, academic staff could uh, spend time on other scholarly activities. Um, it would also help organizations to rationalize teaching tasks that, you know, some people will develop the courses and you don't have to develop the introductory chemistry course or biology course over and over again. You develop one and use it a number of times. When you say, hey, how, how, how different is chemistry one in this university as opposed to chemistry one in another university? But there's a problem with that too. Now, subject matter experts will have to have content knowledge, of course, they have content knowledge, but they cannot be assumed to be having comparable pedagogical and technological knowledge. We need three kinds of knowledge these days in order to function as, as a professional, if you wanted to do it all by yourself. Knowledge about the technology, knowledge about the pedagogy, or the methods of it, and of course the subject matter knowledge. 
as we know, not all three kinds of knowledge, content, pedagogical and technological, are available in one person. So this is an implication on the professional development of staff. And it's good to see, more so now, that when I started my career, that almost all universities have some form of professional development of staff on an ongoing basis, so that they have requisite knowledge in those domains to be able to function as a teacher. Whereas in the past, having content knowledge was enough. So, so if you want to engage in this idea of disaggregating teaching functions, one could argue that it requires shifts in mindsets of staff, students, and institutions. You are no longer thinking of my classroom. You know, people often talk about, oh, I'm going to my class or my subject. It is no one's classroom. No one owns that class. It's like, but, but, but it is not uncommon, you know, uh, you know, doctors use that, oh, my surgery, my room, and lawyers use that all, my court. You know, judges always say, my court. What do you mean, your court? Whose court? It's nobody's court, not your court. It's our court, one could argue, but you try and cross a uh, judge and you know where you're going to be, right? But teachers do the same. So when you think about it, is it your classroom? Well, you know, distance educate have, have, have argued that it, it's no one's classroom. It is the classroom. But it requires a different kind of approach to course design and development, a different mentality, and has to have implications on policy direction. Unless there is policy direction, change is not going to come. And I think uh, leaders of organizations need to know that these kinds of implications of, of, of uh, the challenges. <laughs> In a distributed, disaggregated learning teaching space, the subject matter content uh, would require to relinquish some of their control over content knowledge, as well as how it's taught. And you know, this is a this is the challenge that distance educators have always uh, had. That you know, the minute an instructional designer or course designer has a view about how a subject matter uh, is taught. Walls come down and say, yeah, oh, wait a minute, you, you, that's not your responsibility, you know. Uh, that's, that's my responsibility as a teacher. You, know, you look after the learning management system or student support or whatever it might be. So I think, you know, if you want to engage in distributed learning and disaggregated learning, it requires a shift in mindsets about what the classroom is and what the learning experience is. But there are opportunities, one could argue, and what are those opportunities? To what extent it is important for teachers, subject matter experts, to possess technological and pedagogical competencies? And what are the implications of this for the training of teachers? Policy implications, like I've been saying. So what does the teacher in this new educational space look like? What kinds of qualifications do they have to have for hiring and for promotion? What are their competencies? So in, in conclusion, I, I started reflecting on what, what is mainstream education now? And as I said, you know, I've, I've been through the circuit. I started um, in distance education operations, went through conventional systems, and, and, um, and went back to distance education systems, and, I, and I've reflected on various models of operation, and I'm saying, it seems like everyone is doing everything in bits and pieces. So what is at the center of learning and teaching? What is happening and what is likely to happen? And what about that parity of esteem? What happened to that? One thing has become clear to me, and I would like to see what you think about it, is that distance education, as I was saying, in its broadest forms is here to stay. It's not going to go away. And large part is driven by the proliferation of technology that is becoming accessible. The technology is changing our workspace. And like it or not, educators are slow at it, but it will catch up more and more. Industry is already there. How often do you do, go to the bank to bank, uh, do banking operations? 
rarely I would say in my case. So I would argue that distance education is becoming part of the mainstream. So it's moved significantly from that periphery to the center. You look at this. This, this data comes out of 2011. On, online enrollment is a potential of total enrollments. Just the simple view will tell you the trajectory. Look at the trajectory of it. Now, I know online education is not the same as distance education as we have known it, but many of its features are similar. And in fact, a lot of people would equate online education with distance education. So where, where are the opportunities in that? People who are in the business of distance education would be thinking about this. Online learning technology fast becoming the standard features of campus-based learning. In some cases, you know, all courses at Melbourne University, at Monash University, in fact, there's a greater and greater push for all courses to be online. Now, that's not the same as distance education, but it's, it's, it's working that way. Lectures are becoming less and less relevant. It's becoming fast, becoming an accompaniment. Lectures are being used for certain things, not for everything. And notions of openness are being extended to include educational resources and open scholarship, this idea of sharing without saying, oh, I hold copyright on this, you can't use it. People are very willing to say, oh, yeah, take it away. Use it as much as you like, provided you acknowledge it. So my concluding remark is the methods of teaching and learning pioneered by distance education are becoming part of mainstream educational practice. So finally, I began to reflect and begin to say, what is at the center? What is now at the center, and what is likely to be at the center, and what is the center? Is it going to be distance education that is at the center? Because conventional face-to-face -face education is no longer the way it was, and is not likely to be the way it was. Who is at the fringes, and where, the fr where, 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 where are the fringes? Are we still looking through the back door, or are we at the front door? What about parity of esteem that I raised earlier on? So, so my, 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 my concluding thought is that it seems like the center is in turmoil, and for good reason. Would you consider that things are falling apart, or actually things are evolving? You might like to. Can the center hold, and what is at the center? Thank you very much. I guess I have said a lot. Some of it has been confusing even to me. Um, but, but let's have a talk about that. And I, I, I hope that you've been noting some of your remarks and questions um, as you went through. Uh, but it was important that I say it all in one piece and then, then we, we have a conversation. So I hand it over to Sarah to, to lead the charge on that. Thank you very much, Som. Wow, you covered so much ground. And um, as I was thinking about the things that you were saying, um, you have some really important questions that I think we can apply to our context here at Otago.